This is a mechanism of disease map for Meniere disease. This is a cause of peripheral vertigo, and we'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of Meniere disease. As in all of these flowcharts, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend that you see in the top right, and we'll be clearing all of the boxes and repopulating the chart and talking through them one by one. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with the pathophysiology of Meniere disease. It's a disease that has impaired endolymph absorption. Now, endolymph is a fluid that's in the semicircular canals in your inner ear. And if you don't have absorption of endolymph, you'll end up with accumulation of the fluid in the endolymphatic sacs. This is a condition called endolymph hydrops. Now, we don't know exactly what happens next that leads to onset of symptoms in Meniere disease, but there are two competing pathophysiologies and we'll discuss them both. The first is called rupture theory. When you have so much fluid in the endolymphatic sacs, when you have endolymph hydrops, it creates a tear in the Riesner membrane. This is a membrane that separates the, the potassium-rich endolymph fluid from the sodium-rich perilymph fluid. When you break this membrane, you're gonna have a mixing of the fluids. So that results in increased perilymphatic potassium. So you're gonna have more potassium ions in the perilymphatic fluid because you're mixing the potassium-rich fluid and the sodium-rich fluid. So they're essentially going to kind of become the same liquid because you have a tear in this Riesner membrane. When you have high potassium in the perilymphatic fluid, this causes a depolarization of the afferent acoustic nerve fibers, and that potentially leads to the symptoms of Meniere's disease. The other theory, compression theory, is that when you have so much fluid in the endolymphatic sacs, when you have endolymph hydrops, it causes compression of the semicircular canals, and these canals, of course, are crucial for balance and hearing. And that leads to the, uh, the vertigo, the tinnitus, we'll talk about the manifestations in just a second. So two competing theories, it's possible that it's a combination of both, but they both have a decent amount of evidence in the literature. Before we talk about the manifestations, let's work our way through the etiology, and this will be uh, pretty short. In short, the etiology is idiopathic. We don't know exactly what causes Meniere disease. We don't know if it's just one cause or if there are multiple causes, multiple triggers. There are, again, some theories. There are some proposed etiologies, and these are listed here with some kind of explanations of what kind of leads us to think that these etiologies might be causing the disease. The first, it's possible that it's an allergic etiology. It seems like allergies trigger the symptoms in many patients with Meniere's disease. And in addition, controlling your allergies improves the symptoms of people in, of, of, uh, of, of the disease. So it's possible that allergies have some role or the inflammatory process behind allergies might be related. It's possible that it's an infectious etiology. There have been neurotropic virus antibody titers. So herpes simplex and varicella zoster virus have IgG antibody titers that are higher in the perilymphatic fluid of patients with Meniere's disease. So it's possible that there's some infectious etiology that resulted from having these viruses, and that's what triggers Meniere's disease. Autoimmune etiologies also have a bit of evidence as well. It's possible there's an autoimmune process in the inner ear since the symptoms tend to improve with intratympanic steroid therapy. Of course, steroids are largely anti-inflammatory, and if you have an autoimmune process, it might get better with steroid therapy, so it's possible that's the etiology. And it could also be autoimmune on a systemic level. There have been studies that found antiphospholipid antibodies in the uh, in, in the in, in patients with Meniere's disease. And it's possible that there's a thrombotic event that happens in the labyrinthine circulation in the inner ear. And that's a potential etiology for Meniere's disease as well. So a lot of potential candidates, we don't know exactly what happens and it's possible that it's a combination of multiple things. It's very likely, or not very likely, but it's very possible that it's um, autoimmune and um, infectious or some kind of inflammatory infectious combination that causes the disease. Now let's get into the manifestations. Once you have symptom onset uh, for the disease, you have recurrent episodes of unilateral symptoms, and these symptoms can last minutes to hours. There are three characteristic symptoms that are worth associating with Meniere's disease. The first is vertigo. The patient will report their room is spinning, their surroundings are spinning, or their vision is spinning, and they'll find it hard to stay balanced. They'll be 
um, discoordinated as well. The patient will also have unilateral tinnitus. Tinnitus is hearing a sound. It's usually like a ringing in the ear, but it could also be a tone or a beep or a, another periodic sound in the ear in the absence of an actual external sound being present. And the patient will have that on one side. The patient will also have unilateral sensory neural hearing loss. The hearing loss is typically in the low to mid frequencies, and this hearing loss can get worse with progressive episodes of the disease. And in some cases, it can lead to deafness as well. So these are the three main symptoms, vertigo, unilateral tinnitus, and unilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Now in the clinic, um, patient will tell you they have these symptoms and it'll largely be a clinical diagnosis, but there are some ways that you can check to make sure that their hearing loss is sensory neural as opposed to conductive hearing loss. The first test you'll do in the clinic is with a tuning fork. You can do the Weber test, which will lateralize to the healthy ear, and the Rene test, which will be bilaterally positive, indicating no conductive hearing loss in either ear. And of course, the Weber test lateralizes to the healthy ear, um, indicating that the other ear is the one with sensory neural hearing loss. You can later confirm the sensory neural hearing loss with subjective audiometry, which will be positive for hearing loss in those low to mid frequencies. Patients typically have these episodes with varying severity, so they might say some of their episodes are 2 out of 10 in severities, other will be 6 out of 10. The episodes can last from 20 minutes to 12 hours, so it really could be like an all-day suffering with Meniere disease. Patients will have remission between attacks. They won't have um, constant episodes. They won't have continual symptoms. And this remission can vary from months to years even. Um, it tends to be a progressive illness. And in some cases, it even spreads from being unilateral to being bilateral and about uh, 10 to 20% of patients as well. So pretty broad manifestations. It tends to get worse. Um, and in some cases, it can lead to deafness for that sensory neural hearing loss. There are some other symptoms that you might get. You can have spontaneous horizontal or horizontal rotary nystagmus. You can also have nausea and vomiting, and you can also have ear fullness in this disease as well. And of course, because you have vertigo, because you have this room spinning sensation, it can lead to the patient having falls and having physical injuries or trauma from those falls. So that might be the presentation for Meniere disease as well. This has been it for this flowchart for Meniere disease. I hope it was helpful and thank you for listening.